Hello, hello and welcome. Welcome back to my channel. Today is another true crime video and I'm going to focus on Bernie Madoff and the enormous Ponzi scheme that he pulled off that collapsed in 2008. Um, I was already putting together this video when um, Bernie Madoff came up in the news again this week. He passed away at the age of 82 in federal prison, so that is actually probably not the final chapter of this story, but um, this story is pretty much almost over, so let's get started. Um, who was Bernie Madoff? Why was he famous? Why was his crime um, in the news? Why was it such a big deal? Well, it was the largest financial fraud in history, and that remains true till this day. So until now, um, his Ponzi scheme was the largest financial fraud. It's a little weird to calculate what his fraud was worth, but um, something like $64 billion is where people pin it. And it's hard to actually say what the fraud is worth because um, that money is fake, it never existed, so people thought they had money they didn't, um, and that is worth like where the $64 billion comes in. Um, it's also, as far as we know, the longest Ponzi scheme in history. So Ponzi schemes eventually collapse. Um, that's just a fact about them. And his, although the start date is not agreed upon, um, for sure it's the longest Ponzi scheme in history that has been prosecuted. Um, it's also famous because of when it happened. It was during the 2008 market collapse in the United States that then spread to the rest of the world. And so um, everyone was already very focused on the economy. Everyone was already losing money. And then it was like, oh snap, like this guy, um, you know, he was lying <laughs> and all this money people thought they had, they didn't. And then the other reason I think people were really outraged and upset by this crime in particular was because it's what's known as an affinity crime. Um, Bernie Madoff targeted people within his own community, um, that's the affinity. And so he was a Jewish man in a Jewish community and he targeted other Jewish people, including like Holocaust survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, um, his charity invested in Bernie Madoff. So Bernie Madoff was scamming charities of like famous, important people within his own community. And so there was a lot of very personal hurt and outrage because he did this. Um, yeah, and, you know, entire communities of people um, felt this and lost everything. Or it ended up being more complicated than this, but when it happened in 2008, before any of the money was recovered, you know, people were selling everything they owned because they thought they had retirement plans, they thought they had money for their kids' college, things like that. And it was all a fraud. Um, and it was a fraud done by someone within their own community who was respected in their community and who was defrauding other very respected people in their communities. So that is another reason that this Ponzi scheme became so famous um, and like despised. Okay, so get to the basics. Who is Bernie Madoff? Well, as I said, he um, is a Jewish man, American. He grew up like solidly middle class in the U.S., um, I think in New Jersey, I want to say. And he, um, you know,
know, it's funny. I listen to a lot of interviews with people to sort of get a sense of this crime. And I thought I knew the story pretty well, which is basically what I just said, why he was famous. It was a huge Ponzi scheme. It was an affinity crime. You know, people lost money. There was a lot more to this story than I realized. And um, it was really interesting listening to interviews of people over the past, you know, 12 years, 13 years since this happened. And, um, you know, people said, like, he wasn't charismatic. He didn't light up a room. He talked with a stutter quite frequently. Um, he kept a low profile for all that he was, you know, wonderfully wealthy. For Wall Street and for his line of business, he wasn't necessarily flashing that wealth around. This was confusing to me because at the same time, people were talking about that he had, like, more than one yacht. But I guess either that's common for this set or he wasn't flashy about it. But either way, he wasn't the, you know, great charismatic con man that you might see in, like, The Wolf of Wall Street, for example. Um, like The Wolf of Wall Street, he started small selling penny stocks. Um, he worked for his father-in-law, and it was through his father-in-law that he started getting all of his contacts, um, for his financial business. And it's possible that the fraud started then, to be honest. People are not sure, but I will talk about that more later. First, I want to describe what is a Ponzi scheme. I said this word a couple times already. Um, and what he did was just a basic Ponzi scheme. It's one of the oldest frauds in the book. And it's a pretty simple concept. Um, I'll tell you, okay, give me a thousand dollars. I'll invest it, and I will give you a 10% return every year. Good year, bad year, you're going to get 10% more money year after year. And to you, the investor, that sounds pretty good, right? That's a pretty high return rate. Like, the bank's interest rate is always something horrible, like 0.3% or something. Um, and, you know, investing in stocks, you know, they could go up go down, it's impossible to know, right? So, if I'm, um, your intelligent, trusted friend who has a legitimate business and says, I'm going to get you this return, no matter what, look at my record, everyone gets 10% every year. You might think, okay, that sounds like a good deal, I'll give you my money. Um, the thing is, a 10% return every year is impossible. That is too good to be true. It's never true. And so what the Ponzi schemer does is they don't invest the money. You gave me a thousand dollars. I just kept it. That's my money now. Um, and this is what Bernie Madoff did. He just deposited all of it into his business account at the bank. He just like, okay, deposit that money, didn't invest any of it. And then I'll send you financial statements, you know, every quarter, every year, whatever, and say, you now have this much money. Well, that is just a fake statement. And either I send you that 10% if you want it, or I'll just say, you know, I'll just keep investing it over and over again, compound interest. And you say, great. And you watch your fake statements go up year after year. And you say, okay, I have this really nice nest egg. I'll be able to retire. But what I'm doing, the fraudster, is I am spending your money because it's mine now, you gave it to me, and if you want some of that money that I claim you have, um, I need to get new investors. And that's the problem number one of a Ponzi scheme, is because of the returns, you always do need more investors to come in. So I have to go scam more people. And for most, maybe not most, but for many Ponzi schemers, this is one of the ways the scheme ends is they just can't get enough investors because either I'm, you know, if I'm paying you the interest or paying a few people the interest, 
my money is decreasing. It's not invested in anything, it's a finite amount of money. So eventually people want their money back or they just want some of their money back. And, you know, meanwhile, I've just been spending it because I'm a fraudster. So the money is always declining. Um, but, um, yeah, so again, there's no investment. I'm just paying people back their own money that hasn't changed at all. The other problem is, um, for Ponzi schemes, let's say they do find enough people to, to um, commit fraud against, which Bernie Madoff did. He, you know, this Ponzi scheme lasted a long time. He kept getting more people invested. Um, the problem is when there's a bad year, and this is what happened to Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. If there's a bad year in the economy, people need money. They need to pay the rent. They lost their job or their 401k went belly up, you know, whatever. The stock market did some stuff. Their investments are bad. The price of their house is now worthless. Whatever it is, suddenly people need money. And so they start going to their you know, financial advisor who is a fraud and saying, okay, I want to pull out all of this money that I think I have based on this fraudulent financial statement. And if enough people do that, then the coffers are empty and um, the fraudster ha has to admit that there was no investment, there's no more money, it was a Ponzi scheme. So that is the basic gist of it. Um, just you give me money, I claim I'm going to invest it, but I don't, and then I pay you back your own money while I spend the rest of it on yachts or whatever else Bernie Madoff was doing. He had multiple homes, you know, whatever. Okay, so let's talk more about Bernie Madoff's business specifically. Like I said, he founded a penny stock brokerage in 1960. Um, it's possible this brokerage did have legitimate business. Um, weirdly, he did have one innovation in his company, and that was the use of computers to speed up trades. So prior to this, I mean, this is the 1960s, right? And then going into the 70s, people had handwritten the trades they wanted to do. And so that's a bit slow. Prices, I guess, can change during that time. So he got like a fancy computer and started using computing to speed up the trades. This wasn't trading online yet, um, but it was using computers in a way that was new. And um, interestingly, like this system eventually led to the NASDAQ. Um, so like he actually had a hand in shaping the original NASDAQ which was the first electronic stock market. Um, but other than that, uh, Madoff was sketchy in a lot of ways. Um, he was known for legal kickbacks, so he gave kickbacks, some illegal as well, to everyone. And basically he would, you know, if people invested in Madoff's scheme, he wouldn't charge them fees for it. They got to keep the fees. So people were incentivized to put their money with Madoff because they got paid more to do it. Um, some of this was legal, I think, after the scheme um, came out. It might have become less legal because it was like, hmm, who you know, what kind of person is most incentivized to use these kickbacks? Could it be someone doing fraud who doesn't need the fees because they're just, you know, stealing from their customers? Um, but at the time, um, by the 2000s, Bernie Madoff was well known and respected, but again, he still didn't really take up the limelight. He had been chairman of the NASDAQ for a time, so like he seemed like a legitimate person, more or less. Um, there's some there's some doubt on that we'll talk about later. But he seemed like a legitimate person and he did have a legitimate part of his business. And everyone talks about like the floors. So he was in a building in New York City called the Lipstick Building because it looks like a lipstick kind of 
and the 19th floor was his legitimate business. It was a market maker business. Um, his sons worked this business part. And then there was the illegitimate business on the 17th floor. And that was his management of like wealth division. And it was just crime. So on the 17th floor, they just spent their time um, making the fraudulent financial statements. So what they would do is they would look back at how different stocks and securities performed over the quarter or the year or whatever, and they would do some math and put together a portfolio and say, this is what you're invested in, and so therefore, this is how you got this return, whatever it was. So they would just, um, you know, lie. And that's what was happening on the 17th floor. It was the crime floor. Um, for some reason in the media, this division of floors really got people worked up. They always like to mention it. Um, so, one question people had is, how did this work for so long? How did he get away with it for so long? You know, most Ponzi schemes collapse. They run out of... Um, investors, or there's a bad year, which there were. There were other bad years before 2008. 2008 was just a particularly bad year. Um, the first answer is he promised pretty low returns, like 1%, um, which is still, again, better than what you get at a bank, um, very consistent, and he promised them in good times and in bad times. The other reason it worked for so long is that he had help. Um, when it came to getting people to invest in him, he had help, he had people doing his work for him, and when it came to nobody doing due diligence or investigating or, you know, no, he had help. People were incentivized not to look too closely at what was happening here. So, um, the main source of his help came from what are known as feeder funds. And so these were hedge funds. And let's say, you know, I want to invest in a hedge fund. Um, it sounded like Bernie Madoff told the feeder funds, don't tell anyone I'm involved. Like, all of their promotional material didn't include Bernie Madoff's name, which is one of the ways that he flew under the radar. And so if I'm an investor and I'm just an average person who doesn't know that much about the stock market, I just see, like, respected hedge fund, you know, associated with these people and good returns. And I think, okay, like, these guys wear fancy suits, this is their job, they know what they're doing you know, doing due diligence is like a legally required part of the business. So I'll give my money to these guys who I trust. And then they went and invested with Bernie Madoff. And again, Bernie Madoff um, gave kickbacks. So he didn't um, charge the feeder funds like money, no fees for processing anything, which meant they got to keep um, like the entire commission, essentially. So many of them described this as free money, because it's basically like, I convince you to invest with me, and then, yeah, I make more money if I give all that money to Bernie Madoff than if I, you know, did something else. And these hedge funds, these feeder funds, they did no due diligence on him. They, they really didn't check out what they were investing in. And it just sounds like, in part, because they had no incentive to. It also sounds like um, many of them suspected that he was doing something illegal, and they knew if they probed into it, they would find something, and then they would make less money. Um, and so, here are some of the um, sketchy things he was doing that, like, sent up alarms that people ignored. The thing about him forbidding them from listing him as an investment advisor in any marketing material, that was sketchy. People 
should have been alarmed or curious about that. It was sketchy. Um, he was unregistered with the SEC to have this many investors. Um, I think if you have more than like 15 investors, you have to register as a financial advisor or whatever. And he, he had like over a thousand, I, you know, he, he, this was just very clearly illegal. Um, and even through the 2000s, he only sent his statements in the mail. So despite his earlier, um, technological advances with computing and trading, he sent his statements in the mail, um, in part because this gave him a time cushion to do that dodgy math that I mentioned earlier. You know, the mail takes a few days, so you can have a few days to reflect on how the market did, and then make your false statements, and then go ahead and send those out to your clients. And that's why he did it. And then the last thing that is, um, very absurd to me, and everyone who, you know, learned about it later, is his accountant for his entire, like, multi-billion dollar business was just, like, one dude in a strip mall in New Jersey. And if anyone had gone to that location or, um, you know, Google mapped it or, like, Google Earth, it just, like, tried to figure out, like, where's this accountant? I've never heard of him before. Why isn't it one of these enormous accountant, you know, auditing firms? That would have been a major tip-off that, like, this doesn't seem right. <laughs> so... He was engaging in these sketchy practices, um, and again, people noticed this, people knew it, um, but they thought that he was engaging in a different illegal scheme. And this gets me, um, this, because I thought the story was simple, I thought it was, you know, this con man conned a bunch of people, stole money, got arrested, but what it was, was this con man conned a bunch of people, other people realized he was conning people and thought, I can get in on that action. And they helped him con more people, and this included, like, Swiss banks, financial institutions, lots of hedge funds, particularly one that, um, was based in the U.S. called, like, Fairfield Greenwich. It, so the scheme they thought that he was doing was called front-running. With front-running, if you know a big company is going to buy a bunch of stock, and the reason you know this is because you are a market maker, so maybe they're buying the stock from you, um, you jump in there beforehand and you buy your own. And because buying stock causes the price to go up, um, you just made money very quickly. And you did it um, kind of at the expense of the big company or big investment bank that just bought stock. Now, there are some rules to sort of prevent this. Like, if you have a listed price for stock, you have to sell at that price. So, like, if JP Morgan wants to buy stock from my market maker, and I say this stock costs $3, and then I do this front-running scheme, I buy a bunch of stock, and now it's worth $3.50. I can't charge JP Morgan 350. I have to charge them the listed price. Um, however, if I bought a bunch of stock for myself, the price still went up, right? So now it's 350 or and JP Morgan bought stocks so now it's four dollars, whatever. Um, it is a way to illegally and sketchily make a quick buck. And that is what lots of people thought Bernie Madoff was doing. So, again, this drives me crazy because they all thought he was doing something illegal. They just thought that his illegal scheme was benefiting them. Like, they thought that he was still investing. They thought that he was making money. They just thought, you know, he was doing it illegally in a way that benefited them. And so they kept investing with him because of all the kickbacks. Oh, so... That was upsetting to learn. <laughs> he did get investigated by the SEC actually a, a couple times, but the one that people focus on is the one that happened in 2006 because he was investigated for two years, so from 2006 until 2008. 
and again in 2008 is when his Ponzi scheme collapsed and he turned himself into the feds, sort of. Um, and on the way out, after clearing him in 2008, SEC operatives, like, handed him their resumes. So you can see the problem here. These people, were they investigating or were they networking? The SEC excuse is that they were understaffed and overwhelmed. Um, and maybe that's true, but one of the reasons they were investigated was because of a man named Harry Markopoulos. Um, I think this is a really interesting fellow who's given tons of interviews, and I listened to a few. He's um, very cynical, very jaded, and I understand why, given his experience with Bernie Madoff. So, in the 90s, he was tasked with studying Madoff and figuring out how he was getting such good returns because his company that he worked for wanted to mimic that. They wanted to provide that to their own clients. According to Marco Polis, he figured out Bernie with Bernie Madoff was lying in maybe like five minutes, although in another story it was four hours. Regardless, within the span of an afternoon, he knew Bernie Madoff was lying and he had already uncovered um, basically a statistical analysis that showed what he was doing was impossible. Um, and there were other signs. There were... Um, you know, investments he said he made that were impossible to make, for example, that he put on financial statements. Like, there were careless mistakes that were made. Um, but, so Marco Polis, he goes back to his bosses and he's like, we can't do what Bernie Madoff does. Well, we could, but it would be illegal. And his bosses are like, no, not Madoff. That's not possible. You can go back to your numbers. Um, Marco Polis from what I can tell, kind of became obsessed with this. He sent a report to the SEC and was like, hey, Bernie Madoff is a fraud. You guys need to investigate. The SEC did nothing. Marco Polis quits his job, begins um, basically being like a full-time investigator of fraud. Um, and he, in 2005, wrote a 20-page letter detailing all the red flags, and he called this like a road map to Bernie Madoff's fraud, and all they had to do was go over there and go through, you know, point by point each thing that he said. And the SEC just simply did not do this. So in 2006, they did investigate him, um, but based on this letter in part. There were also two articles that came out before the investigation, um, like one in Barron's, suggesting that Madoff was a fraud. Obviously, it's it's hard to put this in print, right? Because it could be like slander or libel. And so, you know, they just sort of pointed at him. And it was kind of like the Enron situation again, where someone asked, like, how is he making his money? Like, I visited his office and I visited the 19th floor. And it's not that they're not, you know, working or it's not they don't have the people, but it's the amount of money they're making doesn't really add up because it didn't. Um, so this is really frustrating. This guy spent, you know, 10 years trying to get the SEC to listen to him. Um, and that's 10 more years that people were investing tons and tons of money with this guy who was just stealing it. So what was the downfall? How did Bernie Madoff eventually get caught? Um, the answer is he didn't get caught. He basically turned himself in. Well, so in 2007, the housing bubble burst in the U.S. Um, and basically what happened, uh, there was the domino effect. I mean, the markets collapsed. It was a sort of a slow motion collapse of our economy that spread to the entire world. Sorry. Um, and many hedge funds collapsed during this time. Their investments went to zero. They were preventing clients from withdrawing money. They were going belly up and everyone was upset and people 
thought that they had all this money and now it was worthless, right? Um, weirdly, during this time, or not weirdly, unsurprisingly, I guess, Bernie Madoff's fund was still making money because it was all fraud, so he was still reporting his, you know, 1% returns or whatever. And so he was still getting investors. People were pulling their money from, you know, these collapsing hedge funds, and they were giving it to Bernie Madoff, who, you know, was so reliable. Oh. However, by December of 2008, um, more people were pulling out money than putting in money. And basically for that, I mean, like, yeah, Bernie Madoff was more um, secure, but people had bills to pay. You know, they had mortgages, they had whatever, the holidays were coming up, and by December, more people were pulling out, and the jig was up. From Wikipedia, in mid-2008, his business account, which again, which is where he just deposited all the money, had $5.5 billion in it. But by late November, it had about $200 million. And, you know, there were tons of people trying to redeem their money. So, yeah, like a lot of people pulled their money out during that time. Um, and then on December 10th, 2007, which is my birthday, Bernie Madoff sits down with his sons who worked for him on the legitimate part of the business and tells them the business is a fraud. I can't pay out their redemptions. They don't exist. It was all a Ponzi scheme. And he asked his sons to give him a week, essentially to pay out bonuses to his favorite um, employees and then redemptions for his favorite clients. There were people he clearly favored over others based on some of his actions. And he just wanted to like wind down the business and shut it down. And his sons were like, um... No. And they called a lawyer, and then they called the FBI, and they were like, we're not going to be complicit in this crime. And so the next day, the FBI arrives at Madoff's door. Madoff, on the spot, confesses to the FBI and says it was one big lie, and he's arrested. So, that was that. Um... He pleaded guilty to 11 federal felonies, including securities fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud, money laundering, making false statements, perjury, theft from an employee benefit plan, and making false filings with the SEC. And he was given a 150-year sentence. The judge made it that long um, because it was such a big fraud, and again, people were really horrified because of the affinity crime aspect that he that he did this to his own community and that he had um you know taken money from charities like their endowments you know and i mean he did a lot of really cruel and shady things like there was a story about how he went to a funeral um and he approached the widow and said like oh your husband would have wanted you taken care of don't worry, invest with me, invest, you know, everything with me, and I'll take care of you for the rest of your life. And so he just stole all of her money, you know, like, at, at the funeral. So people were just really horrified by his behavior. Um, you can find a lot of very strong words that were said about him and what he did. Um, he, of course, was not the only person implicated in this crime. I haven't really mentioned his lackeys in this, but of course he had them. He couldn't do this fraud by his own. Um, and I mentioned the 17th floor. There was a number of people who worked there. Um, in the end, uh, 15 people were convicted or pleaded guilty. This included his accountant, who worked in that one little building in a strip mall. Um, he admitted that he never audited Madoff's filings, he just kind of rubber stamped it. But he cooperated a lot, so he didn't get a very harsh sentence. Um, Frank DePascali is someone who gets mentioned in, or got mentioned in the news a lot. Um, he pleaded guilty to 10 federal charges. Um, Peter Madoff, is Bernie's younger brother, ended up going to prison. Um, he was released in 2020. Interesting, like J.P. Morgan Chase, the business got two felony counts for not doing due diligence. Um, 
And then, of course, there have been, like, dozens and dozens of civil lawsuits. So, you know, one of the big tasks is finding the money and getting it back to the investors. Um, and so this is where we get into, like, what were the actual losses? What was the actual amount of money? And although Bernie Madoff had essentially claimed that there was $65 billion dollars, in his, um, you know, investments, the actual amount of money was $18 billion, or essentially what everyone put in. So all of your gains from the time of the Ponzi scheme, they didn't exist. Now, of course, this is, for most people, going to count as a loss, because if I invested with Bernie Madoff in, like, you know, 1990, and then in 2008, they tell me, oh, actually, that money you put in 1990 didn't accrue anything, you're only getting back that investment, well, I probably would have invested that money elsewhere in something that would have given me more money, right? Like, even if I just put it in the bank or a treasury or a COD, you know, there, I would have gotten a better return. So it is a loss. I mean, even with just inflation, that's a loss, right? But um, that's, that's essentially how they counted it for people. Um, so there, um, a guy named Picard has been charged with finding the money and then getting it back to people. And what they mean by finding the money is sort of like, one, Madoff stashed it in places, you know, people, people like this hide their money, so it's sort of finding his accounts, finding his assets, liquidating them, and then returning them to people. Um, then there were people who were called winners in the Bernie Madoff scheme, and that's people who ended up getting more money than they paid in. Because, okay, let's say I invested in 1990, and I kept getting these statements saying, your money's increasing, your money's increasing. And I say, great, I'm going to pull out some of that money every year. Um, you know, if it's increasing by 10% a year, I'm going to pull out 3% a year. So it's still increasing, but now I'm, you know, having some money to play around with. And over time, that money can, you know, equal more than um, what I initially put in. And so those are the winners. And Bernie Madoff seemed to have some, like, favorite clients who he gave just tons and tons of money to. So those people essentially got sued for their, for their winnings because um, that money wasn't invested, it wasn't theirs, it was part of the fraud. Now, was it their fault that this happened? Not necessarily. M many of them seemed ignorant. Some of them didn't. Um, but it still was not their money. It's like, you know, if I robbed someone and then gave you $100, you'd be thrilled. Like, oh, thanks, Viscaria, for that $100. But then if you found out that it's because I robbed someone, you'd have to probably give that money back. Like, oh, this wasn't Viscaria's money to give me. Sorry about that. It's uncomfortable um, and a bummer, but that did happen. And when it comes down to it, most of the investors got their initial investment back. It's not everyone. Um, as of 2020, uh, $14 billion in total have been recovered and settled. So, and that's again of $18 billion. Now, $4 billion is still a lot of money. Um, but 14 of 18 is a pretty good percentage. A lot of people in Ponzi schemes, they never get their money back. So I heard actually that in the Madoff scheme, um, people got more back than, than what normally happens. Um, so that's good, I guess. Um, and then, oh, I mean, there were the feeder funds got in trouble as well. Many of them dissolved. I mean, if their entire business was feeding money to Bernie Madoff, they, they got dissolved and sued. Um, Fairfield Greenwich Group in particular, who was one of the worst offenders of, um, you know, investing people with Bernie Madoff across the entire world, they got sued into oblivion. Um, I don't think that they faced any felony charges. I kept looking to see if they did, but it... Um, it all seemed to be civil cases against them, so, um, you know, that's fine, I guess. So, what are the takeaways? The takeaways are, 
Um, if an investment seems too good to be true, it probably is. There's no such thing as someone who has good returns every single year, regardless of the market, um, which is unfortunate. The other takeaway that I had was a lot of people on Wall Street are way more comfortable with crime than I am. I don't really know what to do with that fact, but it was really disheartening to learn about all the people who knew about Bernie Madoff's crime and looked the other way, even if they were wrong about what crime he was committing. Um, Marco Polis has a lot of thoughts about this. I mean, and his argument is, you know, he's not some lone genius who was the only person who could figure it out. He was just one of the only people who bothered and then said something, and even then he was ignored. So that was uncomfortable. Um, in listening to all these interviews and, and reading these things, a lot of um, specialists, they, they all seem to believe that there, there are more Ponzi schemes happening, that this was the biggest Ponzi scheme to date, but it might not be the biggest Ponzi scheme ever. Um, so that is also kind of a bummer. Just be aware that just because one big Ponzi scheme got discovered, that's not going to stop other people from trying to do it. Um, and others were caught around this time that were smaller. Yeah. So those, I think, are the big takeaways. Um, in the end, it is like a sad story. Um, this person, he scammed his own community. He went to prison. His sons never spoke to him again. Um, that they didn't go to prison. They were, it would, it's widely believed they didn't know about the crimes, but, um, they have both since passed away. And, um, I don't know. It, to me, it, the whole thing kind of reads like a tragedy. So, yeah, that is the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme that collapsed in 2008. So if you have money to invest, I would just say uh, avoid get-rich-quick schemes and avoid things that are too good to be true. <laughs>